you get something that you like, you should always um, say thank you because then that means you're like, you like you appreciate it. It's basically about stuff you have, you can love, you love in stuff. I don't really know because I haven't heard of that in my class. Thanksgiving is something that the pilgrims um, made up. They gave thanks because they had a good harvest and just be thankful for all the good things that happen in our life. The whole world? Yeah, the whole world. What's your, what's, what gives, what makes you the most happy? God. God, all right. The Why? whole world and God. Why does God make you so happy? Because he made the whole world. Electricity. <laughs> Why? Because it does stuff for you. More stuff than you can imagine. Um, food. Food? <laughs> Why is food? Because um, we would be starved if we didn't have food, and it would be, and it would be hard for us to stay alive. That's that's a great answer. Well, happy late Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving week is a time where we, where we thank God, we thank others, we thank the world, we have reminders of thankfulness, and we have just so many traditions that go along with it. You know, around my table at home, we go around and have everybody share something they're thankful for. But probably my favorite tradition on Thanksgiving is to gather together on the couch. And this started as a child growing up in East Lansing, Michigan. We turn on the television and we watch the Detroit Lions lose um, on Thanksgiving. And they lose, and they did not let us down this year. They, they, found, a, they found a way to lose. That was their game to win. If you ask any football fan or even kind of a mediocre follower of football, they will say that the Detroit Lions lose on Thanksgiving. They'll probably say that the Dallas Cowboys win on Thanksgiving, and while this year, it went the other way on that one. But I did a little research. I'm 49 years old, and in my lifetime, the Detroit Lions have won 22 times. Now, if they had won 25 times, so three more games, let's do a little bit of math here. If they would have won three more games, they would have won more than they would have lost. So that's real close. But there's this idea that the Detroit Lions lose on Thanksgiving. And while that's kind of a funny little tidbit about the Lions in football, I think we often do that in our lives as well. I really believe that we look at the, the losses. We look at the negatives. We look at the, the things that aren't the way they're supposed to be often much more than we look at the wins or the positives. Today we're going to look at a a passage out of the book of Luke. We'll be in Luke 17, and we're going to look at the story of the 10 lepers. And my, my prayer has been in preparation for today that this just wouldn't be the token Sunday after Thanksgiving thing, I'm supposed to say thank you, and I should be a little bit more thankful. My prayer has been that our lives would truly be changed that we would leave this worship center, we'd leave our couch where we're watching uh, there, we'd leave the family worship venue or the courtyard different, that we would actually take practical steps to live lifestyles of gratitude, not just a Thursday and Sunday of Thanksgiving time, but that our lives would be different because of it. So the, the story of the 10 lepers is found in Luke 17, starting in verse 11. And we read, now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. I want to pause right here to just point out something really big in this. You see, leprosy in Jesus' time was a really big deal. 
Leprosy wasn't a, a minor thing in that it was a little affliction or a disease that, that you kind of had to deal with. Because you see, if you had leprosy in Jesus' time, you were excluded from society. You were excluded from your family. And unless you were blessed enough to find nine other guys that also had leprosy, you lived life alone in seclusion. And then that's aside from actually having a disease that's bacteria growing on your skin that causes sores that are horrific to deal with. Despite or in addition to the physical, there's this emotional toll. There's this separation from everybody else. When these 10 lepers come to Jesus, they are desperate. They are not in a good place. This isn't, hey, can you just hook me up, Jesus? Like this is, we need our lives changed. We're in a very bad place. And so they cry out to Jesus from that spot. Continuing, it says, when he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Now, the priests had a significant role in this in that the priests were the ones, they weren't medical professionals, they weren't the ones who were going to diagnose and treat, but they were able to get a look at someone who had been dealing with leprosy. And they were able to make a statement, a proclamation about whether or not They'd been cleaned. And if they were cleansed, if they were healed of their leprosy, they then could integrate back into society. And we don't know a lot about these 10 lepers. We don't know if they'd been dealing with it for a month or a year or their entire lifetime. But can you imagine, even if it was a short amount of time, to be walking on your way to see the priests? And as you make your way to the temple, you look down and you realize your skin is clean. That for however long it has been, you're now cleansed. You're now healed. But maybe it's been a lifetime that you've been dealing with this, that you can't recall the time that you last looked at your skin and it was clear. The feelings of gratitude of thankfulness, of elation, of relief had had to have been huge, had to be a major deal, because this was a life-altering cleansing. This healing would change them completely. One of them, one of them when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at the feet, at Jesus' feet, and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. A few times in the, the Bible, we, we hear those words, and he was a Samaritan, or she was a Samaritan. And I gotta tell you, that's not incidental or coincidental, it's incredibly intentional. God's trying to make a statement, He's trying to prove a point. Back in 900, around 900 BC, the kingdom of Israel was separated into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Judah was the southern kingdom, and Samaria was in the northern kingdom. And, and conflicts arose at that point because the, the, the nation of Israel and Judah really believed that the way they practiced their faith was the right way, and that the way they practiced it in the northern kingdom was the wrong way that they didn't feel that they were doing it the way they needed to. Fast forward a little bit, and the temple in Samaria is actually destroyed by the southern kingdom. So there's animosity, there's hatred, there is difficulty between the Samaritans and the Jews. Generations of conflict. And yet Jesus has a Samaritan who was the one person who came back and said, thank you. Not the Jews. And there would have been some in that group that were the Jews. That's the reason they pointed out that he was a Samaritan. Now, we don't know, like I said, a lot about their story. We don't know what was going on with these ten lepers. We don't know why the nine lepers didn't come back. We do know that something 
Or maybe multiple things. Maybe a a litany of things prevented them from coming back. But they were just healed of leprosy. And how do we know that? Because we continue on and it says, Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? He knew they were cleansed, by the way. Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. One of the things I love is when I look at scripture uh, is to to look at the original language. Uh, I'm not an expert in Greek. I'm not an expert in ancient Hebrew. There's plenty of tools out there that you can find, books or online, and I use them regularly. Um, But there's two words that I really like in this last sentence. One is faith. He says your faith, uh, and that's the word pistis. That can be your beliefs, your understanding, but it can also mean your faithfulness. I believe Jesus was saying to him that your faithfulness in returning, in recognizing what I had done for you. And then I love this next word, and it has made you well. That well is different than earlier on in the passage where it says cleansed is the word well. This word well is sozo. And sozo means to be saved. It means to be saved from judgment. Jesus is saying to this Samaritan that your faithfulness in returning has now given you eternal life with me. Well beyond, well beyond the sores on your body. You now have an opportunity to spend eternity with me. That's a huge thing because you know in our lives that's what's most important. It's our relationship with God. So today we're going to talk about gratitude, and like I said, it's my prayer that our lives are changed, that we actually leave here different than we came. And as we look at gratitude, I want to to quote um, Robert Emmons. He's one of the leading scientific experts in gratitude. There's actually a science in gratitude. He says, gratitude is the affirmation of goodness in our lives. He says, we also recognize that the source of the goodness is outside the individual. He goes on to say, if you have a faith life of some sort, you may attribute that gratitude to a higher power. And in our case, we understand that it is God who's blessed us. It is God who we should express our gratitude toward. But there are some obstacles, like I said, to gratitude. Something prevented these healed lepers from coming back and saying thank you. And I think one of the obstacles to gratitude that we often find in our lives is comparison. Last week, Pastor Sean talked about the original iPhone when it came out in 2007. That it was a life-changing device. That They were pre-sold. They were sold out before they even came into the stores. That everybody wanted one of these devices. That it was going to alter life completely. But in 2021, I don't think that too many of us would go out there trying to find an original iPhone unless we were looking for maybe a collector's item. Because if you compare that original iPhone to the iPhone that's out there today, it pales in comparison. The comparison it doesn't match up in any way. I think we often compare a device to a device or a, a, our situation to another person's situation. And it's so difficult for us to be grateful for what we have when we look at what other people have. And it's not, and we don't have as much as they have. We don't have the car that they have. We don't have the job that they have. We don't have the home that they have. We don't have the marriage they have, we don't have the children they have or the parents they have or the friends that they have. Comparison eats away at our ability to be grateful. But I don't think it's always even comparing to other people. I think even comparing to ourselves and to our own previous lives or our own previous situations. I think it's easy to have me compare myself today to the 25-year-old me that had a full head of hair. (laughs) And in that comparison, I can not be grateful that God gave me a nice round head that allows for baldness. (laughs) This past week, um, I, I had a lot of reminders of thankfulness. 
And for those of you who don't know, I love to run. It is, it's, it's my favorite thing um, to do by myself is, is, is to run, uh, hobby-wise. Um, love running. I, I, love, I love everything about it. Um, and, and the big thing about running is that, at least for me, is that I always want to do better. I'm always seeking to be faster, have a lower heart rate, feel stronger, go farther. And I'm not getting any younger. And, and it gets harder. At a point, you can't keep getting better. Um, I think you all know that your bodies age, and many of you are probably feeling that. I've also not been able to get out and run as much as I've wanted to. But in the last week, I got to run four times. And I had one run in particular that just... It just hit me, especially as I was preparing for this message. Um, I track all of my runs. I track the distance, my heart rate, the, how many steps I take per minute. I, I, I track it all. Uh, I track my pace, uh, the effort versus previous runs. And I finished this run this week. And I'm not going to get into the specifics of it because it's not about that. But when I finished my run, I was discouraged and disappointed. I had literally just finished doing the thing that I enjoy doing more than anything else as a hobby, and I was disappointed and discouraged and ungrateful because I had compared all of the details of the run to my previous runs. And it wasn't as fast as my previous runs. My heart rate was higher than my previous runs. My cadence was all over the place. It wasn't a good run. And instead of being grateful, that I have a body that allowed me to go run. Instead of being grateful that I got to run along the beautiful Monterey Bay. Instead of being grateful that I got to spend a significant amount of quality time talking to my Father in heaven, which I do on my runs every time. I was disappointed and ungrateful. But comparing to my own situations, to a a previous situation, a previous way of running, I wasn't able to appreciate and be grateful for this one. Comparison will will get in the way of us expressing and really recognizing gratitude. Contentment is another one. I believe that contentment is a big, big obstacle to gratitude. Gratitude. And contentment is really being unhappy or unsatisfied with what we have or our situation. And before I go any further, i got to say there's such thing as healthy contentment. There's such thing as looking in the mirror and seeing that I'm unhealthy, that maybe my weight has grown a little bit and I'm, my waist size has gotten a little bigger, and I can be discontent with that, and I can take steps to improve my health. I can be discontent with how I wake up every morning tired. And I can take some steps to get better sleep. I can be discontent with the status of my marriage. And be willing to put the work in to improve it. I can be discontent in many ways that lead to to forward motion that is good. I can be discontent with my, my job. And I can go seek education that will help prepare me for another opportunity. Discontentment in and of itself is not bad. There's many ways to have healthy discontentment, to want better and to want more. But when that becomes the thing we focus on, when we can't find ourselves content in any situation because nothing is ever good enough, we will never, ever be able to live lives of gratitude. And then life circumstances are also an obstacle to gratitude. And I know for many of you, your current life circumstances are rough. Maybe these last couple of years have been brutal. Maybe you've found yourself unemployed. Maybe you've had relationships that have been fractured. Maybe you've lost loved ones in your life unexpectedly. That there can be a lot in this life that can get in the way of gratitude. And the fact is that there is a lot of hard stuff that happens in our lives. 
I love what Paul says in his letter to the Thessalonians and uh, the church at Thessalonica. And when I say what Paul says, you got to hear this. God is speaking to this church in Thessalonica through Paul. As we read the, the letters of the Bible, it is God speaking to his people then when they were written and God speaking to his people today. But he says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. He, he doesn't say give thanks to God when we've got good circumstances. He doesn't say give thanks to God when circumstances are looking up and going our way, but that we are to give thanks in all circumstances. And I love the next part, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Because you see, God knows what gratitude does for us. God knows the importance of gratitude in our lives. God knows how gratitude is beneficial to us. God knows the benefits to gratitude. It says in Psalm 103 too, praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits. I really believe today the reminder that we need is that God has blessed us greatly. And that whatever our situation is in life, there are benefits and blessings that we can count if we so choose to do so. And like I said, God wants us to give thanks in all circumstances because he understands the benefits of gratitude. Another letter that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, um, we read there, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I think today this passage really applies to our lives as we see stress and anxiety at an all-time high, I believe, in our society. I see it with my kids. I see it as I interact with, with other students in our middle schools and our, in our high schools. I see it as I watch the news or I surf the internet. I see it as I have conversations with people after services that stress and anxiety are high. What God is saying here, though, is that when we're able to be grateful, again, to, to present our requests with thanksgiving, that we'll have a lessened level of stress and anxiety. So we all deal with stress and anxiety every day. And research has found, and I love when research backs up what we already know from God's word, research shows that being grateful might keep our minds from getting so worked up worrying about things. And when you're in the middle of a stressful situation, refocusing on what you're grateful for can calm the body and the mind. This reduces symptoms of stress. See, when you choose gratitude over negativity, you also feel less emotionally charged. A sense of gratitude allows you to respond rather than react in a specific way situation. Gratitude is helpful in reducing stress and anxiety. Gratitude also strengthens relationships. Gratitude strikes and strengthens relationships with God and with others. You know, our earthly relationships, they're going to come with disappointments. There's going to be difficulties in our relationships, whether they be with a spouse, a child, a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, a random person on the highway. As we grow closer to other people, we, we get a better look at their shortcomings. And those often can be the things that we focus on. We can see the losses and not the wins and miss out on a lot. But I think the more we develop an attitude of thankfulness and of gratitude, the more it allows us to focus on the good qualities in other people, that we can then see them in a different light. And as we focus on the good, there's more positive attributes we'll find. There were a series of studies that were done in 2012 about gratitude, and they found that they also increase empathy and reduce aggressive behavior. 
Gratitude motivates people to express, express sensitivity and concern for others. Aggression is obviously the opposite, and that is decreased or reduced in grateful people. Some research done by John Templeton Foundation found that there's a gap between the gratitude Americans feel and the gratitude that they express. I need to explain this a little bit more because I think this is really an important thing. See, living a life of gratitude, having a lifestyle of gratitude isn't about saying thank you when someone gives you something. It isn't about making a quick statement or a recognition within your mind. I saw some studies which were great, and, and I encourage you to go search for yourself. There's plenty of secular and Christian studies out there about our thoughts, about gratefulness and gratitude and how that impacts our lives. But I saw one study in particular that was done that showed that 90% of Americans are thankful for their families. The same study showed that 42% of those people actually expressed that thankfulness. And that there's a difference in the chemistry of the brain between those who just said they were thankful and those who actually expressed it to the people in their lives. You see, taking that step of action has a completely different impact on our lives. Gratitude can make you healthier. It can make you mentally healthier, emotionally healthier. It can even make you physically healthier. Healthier, According to the American Heart Association, grateful people can have lower blood pressure and a greater immune response. That those people who are grateful as a lifestyle exercise more, eat better, sleep better at night, and grateful people are more likely to care for themselves. These are truths that that we know, and this is why God wants us to be grateful. This is why God wants us to live lives of thankfulness, because he knows it's good. He knows it's good for our relationships. He knows it's good for us personally. Gratitude can make us more joyful. And there's two pieces to this in particular. Gratitude causes the brain to increase in the production of both dopamine and serotonin. Dopamine is known as the feel-good neurotransmitter. It gives us feelings of elation and of, it gives us a good feel to ourselves. And as we are grateful, as we are thankful, the dopamine levels in our body rise and makes us more joyful. Serotonin is a, a chemical in our brains that is considered to be a mood stabilizer. It helps reduce depression regulate anxiety, heal wounds, and maintain bone health even. When we're grateful, dopamine and serotonin are increased in our bodies. This isn't a surprise. This is the way God has designed us. Because he knows that when we are grateful, when we are thankful, there's many benefits to it. So how do we get there? What are some steps to gratitude? Uh, Here at Shoreline Church, we have what we call the seven markers of spiritual health or seven spiritual growth markers. One of them is Bible engagement. And and you'll see periodically in our bulletin or on different um, areas, a, a different little icon. Bible engagement really means getting into God's word. It means spending time reading God's word. Every week we have on the app, and on our website, and if you don't have the app as you leave here today, and you can get it through the app store as well, um, as you leave here today, you can scan a QR code and get the app. There's a reading every day. So I wrote seven different readings uh, out of the Bible that I encouraged you to read this past week to prepare for today, and we've got another seven coming this, this coming week. It gives you a starting point of how to get into the Word. Because see, the more time you spend in God's word, the more grateful and thankful you'll be. I know it with all my heart. Another way to engage in the Bible is through memorization. And every week we have the same thing. We have a verse that we give you called Memorize and Reflect. And this week's comes out of 1 Thessalonians. It's 5.18. And it says, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you 
in Christ Jesus. If you commit this week to memorizing that scripture, that verse will be implanted in your brain. And as you are in situations where you are not feeling grateful, you're not feeling thankful, God can pull that verse back up and remind you that you are to give thanks in all circumstances because this is his will for you in Christ Jesus. Another one of our spiritual markers is passionate prayer. We read again, as I said earlier, in Philippians 4, 6 through 8, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, and with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God wants us to pray. He wants us to bring to him our request. He wants us to bring requests to him with thanksgiving. But he wants us to talk to him. And every week we have a prayer direction as well, which is just some guidance to this week we encourage you to go down this road of prayer. And this week it's along the lines of this message and it's to ask God to reveal to you the many blessings in your life and to thank him for each one as they come to mind. And then every week we also have what we call a live it challenge. And it's, it's kind of how you can take the prayer direction and and apply it to your life. And this week, it's called prayer and journal, and it's to spend that 15 minutes asking God to reveal to you the blessings in your life, and then to write about it, to journal it. Maybe you do it this week, or maybe you continue on from there. I talked earlier about Robert Emmons, who is the uh, scientific expert in gratitude. My wife is the practical expert in that. Um, this right here is a list of her thankful journals. And this is her most recent one. Uh, and yesterday she got to 20,013 thankfuls. She started this eight years ago in 2014. And every day she's been doing it. And she started writing three a day. And uh, there's this idea in uh, psychology called flooding, and it's that thing which you cultivate, the thoughts that you cultivate, they'll keep growing and growing and growing. She doesn't have a day now where there's only three. It's almost impossible for her. She just writes and writes and writes until she can't write anymore or she has to go cook dinner. Um, <laughs> but now she's able to pull these things back out. She's able to have an opportunity when she's having difficulty in a situation or a circumstance or maybe not feeling grateful and she can say, I've got 20,000 memories of good things in my life. When we journal, we, we get to put pen to paper, we get to refer back to it later, we get to actually have something that's tangible. And the more and more we practice being grateful, the more grateful we're going to be, and the more benefits we're going to experience in our life. Philippians 4, 8, and 9 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. When you come to church on Sunday mornings or you tune in online, you're going to hear from a pastor. You're going to hear at Shoreline from God through his word. My parting words to you today are to put it into practice, to take what you have heard today and do something with it. Allow God to change your life I promise you, if you are able to develop a growing lifestyle of gratitude, even if you're pretty good at it now, if you can improve in it, God will do amazing things in you and through you that will transform your lives, your family's lives, and the lives of those you encounter in this world. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for the reminders you've been giving me about the importance of gratitude. 
And I pray as you've started to cultivate that in me and as you have done in my wife for eight years, would you do that through this entire church body? Each person here today in the family worship venue, in the courtyard, viewing online, or those who will view this in the future, Lord, would you change each and every one of our lives and allow us to truly develop lifestyles of gratitude. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, I've got a few announcements that we have every week. We love to pray for you. If you have something you would like prayer for, we'll have some prayer partners up here if you're in the worship center or on campus. If you're online, uh, we'd love to have you call 221-0290, and we'd love to pray for you. You can also text your prayer request there, or, um, or you can email prayer at shoreline.church. And if you're new today, we'd love to welcome you officially. Um, you can text welcome, the word welcome, to 831-221-0290, and we'll send you a digital connection card. That'll allow us to, to help integrate you more, and more easily into the life of the church, tell you about our ministries, what we're doing, because we would love to get you connected into the body at Shoreline Church. And if you're here on campus, you can go to the Connection Center, and they'd love to talk to you there as well. And then this Wednesday, we've got our night of worship. Once a month, we do a, a Wednesday night service. And this Wednesday night, uh, I'm excited about it. We're going to do a, a family-friendly service, so we're not going to have children's programming. Everybody will be together um, in, in the worship center for the night of worship. And then we'll go out into the courtyard, and we're going to do a tree lighting, and it's going to be just a fun evening. Uh, we'd love to have you come here this Wednesday. Wednesday, 615 at Shoreline. And if you would indulge me now, and please stand if you're able, I would love to send you off with a blessing. May you go in a lifestyle of gratitude, understanding that God has blessed you more than you recognize or remember. May God cultivate in you a heart that longs for him more, that longs to live lifestyles of gratitude, and may that lifestyle pour out of you into your family, into your neighbors, into your coworkers, into this community and around the world. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.